Okay, this talk is entitled Ask the Leader and is being hosted by Neil McGovern. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for turning up. Uh, I have with me, obviously, the, uh, the DPL, Debian Project Leader, uh, Stefano Zaccaroli. Um, he's here to answer your questions. The idea is um, essentially anyone can ask him any questions. He hasn't seen any of these questions beforehand. Um, I solicited um, some responses on IRC and by mail and, and got a few questions back. And, and after that, I'll, I'll open up questions to the floor, so uh, if anyone wants to follow up on anything or anything they have a burning desire to ask, then, th then please feel free. And if that were clear already, the default for inflicting you all this is Neil's fault, it's not my fault, so. Um, so you've, Zach, you've, um, you've been around a, a, a lot of different people in, in the community, not just in Debian, and um, you gave a talk about why you think Debian is, is still important and still relevant. Um, why do you think that, what is it that you think that Debian adds to the free software community and, and, and its, its place within that community? So, the, first of all, I, I, I delivered that talk with that uh, rather provocative, provocative title, which was something like, Who the bloody hell cares about Debian? And I think the, the reason why I wanted to do that talk is that we have a lot of people among us have been doing Debian for so long that we might have forgot why we are doing it. And also the reason for existence of Debian over time has shifted a bit. So back like 18 years ago was, you know, just one among the other distribution made in a new way, in a collaborative way. But nowadays it's important to define what Debian still has to, to give. And that's something which I've been telling in most of my DPL talks since I've been elected. Um, what I think we have to give is actually our own governance model, which is, I think, unique among the, the big, dis let's say, the big distribution, which a bit, it's a bit awkward to say because it's not like there are, you know, uh, the big player and the small player and we are b better than the other. It's not like that. But the popularity of a distribution is a, fact, is a thing that exists. And we are for sure one of the most popular distributions. And among them, we are pretty unique in the fact that we are a volunteer-based project. And we have a governance model which is very open, in which it's easy to have an impact on the distributions. So if you're willing to do the work, you can essentially change everything in Debian. And also, we, have, we are deeply rooted in uh, free software ideals. So if you take these things together, I think we are pretty unique, and we, we should be aware of that, and we should you know, strive to make the project, the project you know, uh, um, live long and prosper. And how do you think um, other people um, see Debian? Is, is the, the, what's the perception, do you think, of Debian with, with on, not only just the community and other Linux distributions out there, but also the users and, and people who use us? You mean technically? Or? Uh, both technically and socially. Okay. So I think we are seen as a distribution which is for us hardcore geeks, so for tech-savvy techn tech users which maybe we not um, are able to use Debian. And I think we are perceived as, as a distribution which has a, some sort of ent technical entry barrier that you need to, you know, to go through before, before being able to use it. That is on a technical level. And on an ideal level, I think we might also be seen as some sort of fanatic of free software, which are not ready to give some uh, easy stuff to use to people just because it would not fit with some our ideals, um, which are, might be perceived as somehow fanatic. I think that that's not a good, well, it, technically it might be a good representation, but I don't think we have, you know, uh, set that as a goal. It's, I think distribution is, Debian is the right distribution for people who understand free software ideals, no matter their technical level. So I think we are a good fit also potentially for newbie, as long as they get why we are doing what we are doing, I think we are a good match. And then the technical skill which I need to use Debian can be easily learned. And, about the fact that we are perceived as difficult to use, I think it's just a matter of the people who are doing Debian that historically are more of the system administration type than of the you know, desktop user type. But I think if we found people that can make Debian easier to use on the desktop, we will have no problem in integrating the needed changes in the distro. We, we, well, we have in the past had um, the Debian desktop project, which 
gone, gone very quiet recently. Is it, do you think it's important that this is something we, we should be concentrating time on in, in making Debian easier to use? Is it a bad thing that, that we, we have a reputation as being a, a hardcore distro, however undeserved it may be? Uh, I think it's something we should work on. So I know we have a Debian desktop mailing list. I confess I've never been involved with uh, that list because, well, it was not my area of interest in the project in the first place. But uh, I know it exists. I know they work on, for instance, uh, the theme. So a release after the release, they work on the visual identity of that Debian release. And I think that's something which is very needed, very much needed. And I think we should just advertise it a bit more. We should give a message like, well, you know, Debian is for everybody, so if you are the desktop user type, well, maybe you should come to us, join that initiative, and make Debian easier to use on the desktop. And I've seen a lot of people in this conference who actually care about that. There is people, I think there is in parallel to this session, some, a session which is trying to identify the small things which make it needlessly difficult to use Debian on the desktop. I've seen various people blogging about this kind of stuff. So yes, it's a direction in which I think we should push. And, um, and the way to push for it will be just you know, attracting people who want to do that. And, and given that it is still at the moment quite hard, we have the title that Debian is the universal operating system. Mm -hmm. Does that still hold? Uh, so that title, I think it's sort of weird history. So I think it's entered the, the, the history of Debian in uh, some weird way, but it's something that I think we, we started to like. I think it's universal not necessarily meaning that it's good as it is for every possible use case, but it's universal in the sense that uh, if you want to make Debian useful for a specific use case, you are free to come join us and actually do that. That is my own interpretation of universal, but universality. But I know there are different you know, notions like runs everywhere or a lot of other different interpretations. Uh, let's move quickly on to other distributions in the area. Um, what, what, what do you think that other distributions are doing better than Debian? And um, which of those things that they're doing should, should we be doing? Hmm. So I think we have been the first in doing uh, a lot of stuff in the distribution area, but other have uh, essentially been learning from what we did right and what we did wrong. For instance, I think in terms of governance, we can be way more, uh, how to say, open by, for instance, by setting up governance boards, which are not, you know, not only the, the DPL role or not only the delegates. So I think that other distribution has been watching what Debian has done and learn from it and establish better structure and governance is one of them. Um, what else? So, well, there are a lot of stuff that they cannot mentioned at the moment, but I think it's about time for us to stop looking only at Debian and review what other distros are doing and, you know, concede that they might have gotten various things right, even if they didn't do it the way we are used to. So is that a plea for system D, perhaps? Uh, no, not at all. It's not specific to that. But, <laughs> I mean, technical, not about technical issues. I'm more concerned about, you know, cultural communities. And, for instance, I think the example of uh, deciding together a code of conduct, well, it's a good example that many other projects are, are pushing out. Well, there is one well-known code of conduct which has been pushed like rather top-down, but then other projects have started to think, okay, maybe it's a good idea for us, and then, you know, this kind of change is, is something we can, we should look at and learn from them. So, uh, something and not working? Testing. Is that working? Um, somebody mentioned, I th was it BDL earlier in the week, that uh, it's very difficult to retrofit uh, social codes uh, like, like a code of conduct. Uh, and uh, I think that we were very fortunate in Ubuntu that we were able to set that from the start. Um, and it was, it was always my sense as well that it would be very difficult to... Uh, to retrofit that to Debian. Uh, how do you think, or do you think it's at all feasible to, uh, to make that sort of change post hoc in the, uh, in the Debian community? So yes, I agree that this particular aspect of uh, Ubuntu governance, I believe it's something that has been learned from the experience in Debian. And I guess that the point is that if you look back 20 years when Debian has been created, I think nobody thought that 
a community could be big enough to have important social issues. So if you look at the constitution, they are very tough on the technical committee part. So they, there is a body for resolving technical disputes, but there is no provision whatsoever about social issues. And I think it's normal that back then no one was thinking of it. About Debian going that way, well, it's way more difficult to add something like that in an existing project than it is, you know, creating from scratch a new community and sort of imposing that change from day one. So as a direction, I think it's something we should consider, but it's by no means easy. Because you know, even if, you know, um, the code of conduct in uh, not only in Ubuntu, it has been adopted in other projects, it's something that it's opt-in, essentially. It's a requirement to join the community, but it's an individual step. So imposing that to an existing community which has been created without that requirement, it's very difficult at the social level. Zach, I'm disappointed by your answer. I don't think it's working. Well, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I'm disappointed by that answer. I think that I, I think that you can say what you usually say, which is the democracy will make that happen. And I think that to to get a code of conduct, the way it would start would be individuals writing it and opting in for themselves, and everyone else noticing it was a good idea, and slowly over ten years, the community moving that direction. Oh, yeah, and be bold. Can you summarize the question for me? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think it was more comment. Um, okay. Let's say, why, why do you think um, this should be something that you as a DPL push for rather than um, the community coming up with it themselves? If, if the community haven't already decided that they want code of conduct, why do you think it, that, oh. that you should um, enforce that on them? No. no, not quite. Oh. But, but I, can answer to that. I can answer to that briefly. So I actually don't think it's something that the DPL should put forward. So I think DPL is just you know, coordinating discussions and tensions and uh, desire that exist in, Debian, in the Debian project and actually try to drive them to conclusion. But I don't think it's something that should be pushed specifically by the DPL. But in general, and this is one of the points I made in the opening speech of this conference, I think we, it's time for Debian to realize that there are uh, like um, auxiliary tasks, which are very much needed to make the Debian project you know, sustainable and s in some way professional, not in the company sense, but in way, you know, being efficient in, in supporting the project itself. And thinking about social issues is, is one of those directions. Okay. So in, in terms of the uh, other projects and, and things that are going out, not, not just other distributions, um, there's also talk at the moment of um, project harmony. Um, mm -hmm which uh, involves copyright assignment. What, what do you think about that? Hmm. Is this something that Debian should be looking into? So this is mean. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't say I was going to be nice with my So uh, there are some advantages in having a single entity having copyright for all a specific base of software. Um, but I think there is a huge difference in you know, assigning a copyright to a company and assigning a copyright to some um, non-profit organization. So um, I don't think Debian needs something like that, in particular because we don't do much development in the first place. Uh, most of the code, we, a lot of the code we write is packaging stuff which do not get linked in software itself. So um, I don't think we need that. Uh, personally, as a free software enthusiast, I disagree we need um, copyright assignment in the first place. But this is a personal position. I generally, I don't see the need for us to even have a position on something like that. Emmet, I guess you have a question. Okay. Okay, um, so you, you mentioned briefly, but how do you think it's the, the DPL can guide the project? DPL uh, what? Can guide the project. How do, you, how do you see your role as basically steering the project uh, around, or, or, or do you just see um, yourself, your role as being there to facilitate what the project okay, wants? So I have an interesting discussion with the DDR Abu on this point, which was, so in the, if you look at the constitution, there is written that the, the DPL essentially guide the discussions, but should not use his position to, you know, um, favor his position, um, take advantage of his position to impose his own view on the project. So I think it's really sort of a secretary role in which you, you keep track of what the project needs to discuss and you start to you know, propose the discussion, see what people stay and actually say, okay, I believe that the consensus is this or is that or I believe we don't, do, do not have consensus at all. But it's, the distinction is quite blurry because at the same time, 
I personally don't want to censor myself and not expressing my view just because I am the DPL. So it's kind of middle ground on that front. Okay, and uh, in terms of um, the amount of DDs we have now, the, uh, the DD population has um, shrunk due to inactivity or more precisely quite sharply because we picked up on the, acti in the activity before. Um, how would you um, encourage new people, others who perhaps haven't been interested in Debian before or, or involved at all to, to get involved? I know you mentioned the sort of management and, and other tasks we have, but, but would it be quite difficult for Debian with, with our, our reputation as a hardcore distribution to, to, to push that? Okay, so I think we, we need a sort of strategy in where we are going to you know, pick new people that would like to join Debian. Part of the strategy I've been trying to pursue in that direction is actually going to derivatives, explaining what Debian is about, and explaining that if they share the value of Debian, they, should, they could contribute to Debian directly and benefiting not only the derivative they started from, but also Debian and also free software as a whole. I think that sort of strategy has worked quite well, because if you look at the, the flow of new developers in Debian, quite some of them come from derivative distribution. Of course, a lot comes from Ubuntu, because it's the most popular derivatives we have, and also the one which you know, reaches out to a very large public. So that's, I think, part of the strategy we should pursue. Another is making clear what are the areas of contribution you can work on in Debian. For instance, if people think that um, Debian do not need web skills or graphic arts, well, you will not be able to attract those kind of people. So I think we should make it clear on our website or in general in our documentation what are the, um, the area in which you can work in Debian, what are the areas in which your contributions are welcome, and as a separate step which we have already taken, making clear that all these kind of contributions matter to become part of Debian. And this is something we have done. So you can become a Debian developer as long as you share the value of Debian, and as long as you are ready to make commitment in contributing Debian in the long run. Rhonda? There is a question related from ISC from Kevix um, about how to get more people involved in Debian. I know you covered that in one of your talks that we're doing quite well, but it doesn't probably look like that to the outside, and it's always better to have more people around than... So part of the answer is what I was saying, so clarify on our documentation now to join Debian in which area you could work, like uh, divide peer profile, so are you a developer, I mean a pure software developer, those are the tasks, the development tasks we need. Are you an artist, those are the things we need. So this is a first step. Another one is actually giving credit to all the kind of contribution we have in Debian. A long time ago we used to have a page which was the list of package maintainers, we still have it, and, but is now, pol let's say, polluted by all the teams. So the maintainer field is now more and more often associated to a team, which is great, but make it a bit difficult to know who is working on what, and I think we need a central place in which you see all the people contributing to Debian, not only the Debian developers, but also people committing to some alias project, translators, porters, and you see that this person is doing this, this, and that in Debian. In a central place, that would be, I think, a very good step forward to you know, uh, give credit to people who are working on Debian and motivate people, even if it's only on an ego basis. You, know, you, you see, you see my, my name is on that page. I'm doing this, this, and that for Debian. Although you say the, well, although the number of Debian developers themselves have, has, has, uh, has gone down slightly recently, um, do you feel that um, the amount of people contributing to Debian has increased, especially since um, Ubuntu and the other derived distributions. So that the figure of existing developers is an interesting figure because, so um, a couple of years ago, uh, Dam started doing uh, a run to see who is inactive and to remove them from the project, which I think is a healthy thing to do. And uh, then we had a drop of like 100 people, something like that. And then in the press they were saying, oh, the, the, the Debian project is dying, they are losing a lot of people, while it was simply you know, bringing the figures back into uh, a good representation of reality. So very few projects out there have the history of Debian. Very, I mean, free software project. Very few free software projects have been around for 18 years. So we have a problem of turnover and actually making a sane turnover of people going away and new people joining. And this is something not many projects out there have. 
Um, I think the flow of new people is um, pretty steady. And uh, so I think, all in all, we have um, quite uh, healthy turnover of people. It's difficult to keep that in, you know, uh, being uh, matching the reality of people actually working on Debian. But overall, I'm pretty happy about the flow of people coming in and going out of Debian. I do want to just ask about the makeup of those people. Um, the diversity of development of developers is is quite poor in, in Debian. And to be fair, it's, it's not just Debian. It's it's free software and computer science in general. Um, specifically, um, with regards to um, uh, um, gender diversity, um, so the amount of um, the overwhelming uh, amount of males in the project, and also um, the um, BME uh, um, diversity. So, so it's quite still centered on uh, European and North American um, developers as, as a percentage. Um, how would you like to would you like to see that change? Is there anything specific you you would like to do to to try and address that? So that's a, a very difficult problem. It's absolutely a problem for us. I think we tend to be a sort of, well, not only us, as you said, the several free software projects tend to be monocultures, and monocultures are in general bad because you, you don't have many different views represented. I think we should aim for diversity on every level. First of all, gender diversity, which, as you said, is very low. Uh, in that specific um, aspect, I think we should compare, however, with the diversity that that exist in general in computer science and in free software. But the problem is that even if you compare to the gender diversity you have in computer science and in IT, in free software, it's way lower than that. So it's even more of a problem. Although I think Debian is uh, representative of general figures in free software. So I don't think we are doing necessarily worse than other free software projects. And uh, I'm very proud that, you know, initiative like Debian Women uh, was one of the first initiatives to actually increase diversity in free software, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, so it is a big problem, having low diversity. I'm not very exactly sure of how to tackle that. So I think that, you know, the non -con accepting as developer people doing other stuff than packaging was a good step. But so that's a topic in which I welcome every input you can have because it's really something we need to work on. Now, m moving slightly on, um, we, we have recently had a, a distinct lack of GRs in the project. Uh, I, think hey. the, I, I, I think the last one was very consensual anyway. It was uh, essentially, should we do this thing which everyone seems to agree with? And it was about putting a, a stamp on it. W why do you... Do you think that, that we haven't had anything as divisive as, as previously? So my view on GR is that we should not use them for technical stuff. So we should use them for you know, general direction, political direction, philosophical direction of the project, but we should really not use them for technical stuff because we know from experience of you know, standardization body which has existed since 20 to 30 years that consensus and working code is a better way to take you know, large decision than voting because it's very prone you know, to, I wouldn't say populism, but you know, it's very prone to uh, asking non-informed judgment on specific technical issues. I think the fact that we have had not many GR lately, it, it's a good sign. It's a sign that we are making uh, consensus actually work, even if we are a very big project, and even if we, have, uh, we always have someone who will disagree with everything. So one of the, I think one of the most interesting questions I've been asked in interviews was like, uh, so you will be representing a project of 1,000 developers with 2,000 different opinions. So, and, you know, it's true, but working on consensus is better than voting on every single issue. The, well, also on the political direction, I mean, when you were elected, you had a majority of 380. You were also the, the, the only one standing, um, which, which always helps if, if you're seeking an election. As, as a I politician, felt, I, I know that. That, that. That's very useful. I felt um, like a dictator at that yeah, moment. Um, do, you, do you think that a possible factor in why people don't run anymore is that the DPL role has got too large? Uh, I'm scared by that. So it seems to me that people are, have been happy with some of the things which I've been doing, and of course I appreciate that. But I do feel bad about the fact that no one is willing to, you know, in that election being the only candidate has been pretty sad for me because I feel like, you know, uh, 
if someone does a good job at that, then no one else felt entitled to step in, and that's not particularly good because uh, I think we need to sort of train generation of uh, DPL as long as we have this role. That's something we should do because it's an important role. So um, yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure what to do to change that, but I am a bit scared about that specific aspect. Is so people, come on, step in, run for DPL in the next elections. Is there any other reason you think why why people haven't stood last time? Um, I'm not sure. I, so even though it sounds like self-praise, I think that's a likely reason because I think I've made a mistake in you know making uh, clear that I would be running again too too early. I should have done that for the very last minute. Uh, but yes, what you, what you said is right. So it's it might be a sort of a scary role. So um, that's another problem. So the question is: Is it sustainable as a role to have a project big like Debian? And having, asking a volunteer to do that, is it sustainable or not? That's a, a good question. I don't have a good answer at the moment. Will you run again? I, I, can, I can pretend I didn't answer the question. Of course. Colin. <laughs> um, so you've, uh, you've said in the past that uh, you've been fortunate that your employer has, uh, has supported your uh, uh, your work on uh, your work as DPL. Do you feel that's essential nowadays? Uh, if, I think it is not necessarily essential in terms of work time because, well, the DPL all you can stretch or enlarge what the time you spend on it quite in a quite flexible manner. So if you have uh, a lot of time, you can do a lot of work. If you have a bit, if you have less time, you can do, you will do less. Uh, but I think it's very important at how to say, uh, responsibility level, as a, you know, as a f feeling responsible and feeling you have enough energy to work on that. So for me, it's been very important to know that in theory, I could have, you know, stretched my work time to work a bit on uh, DPL time, even if I didn't necessarily use that that often. But knowing that the possibility was there at a psychological level has been very important for me. So in lack of any other questions, will you run again? Um, I don't think so, so I think it's something that you need to have a lot of enthusiasm to do. I'm still very enthusiastic about what I'm doing now, but I'm not sure I will have enough enthusiasm to do that for another year. So at the moment, I don't think so. Uh. <laughs> Two years does seem to be sort of the limit that, that people come to, um, because I you know certainly it's, it can be very hard to, to keep that going over the long term. Um, do you think there should be a enforced maximum two-year limit on DPLs to prevent someone thinking that they could do more when they can't? So, uh, you mean as a you know as a self-defense measure? Mm. Um, I don't know. It's very personal. How do you take this kind of stuff? So, I'm not sure a, a strict role will will help. And also, there are a lot of people making the analogy to, you know, state constitutions and the Debian constitution, and say why why there is no uh, hard limit on the number of time. But actually, DPL is not that much power technically. It's just a, you know, a coordinator and someone who could use moral suasion to convince people to do something or something else. I don't think there is a need to put any strong barrier to avoid abuse of power or whatever. So on to a couple of easier questions now, I suppose. <laughs> What's the proudest thing you've done as DPL? Oh, this, I get asked the question fairly often and I, I fail to have an answer. Um, I think even if it's not something which is very visible, it's like um, streamlining a bit the role. So trying to be very transparent on what I do and being regular and sending updates to the project, it might be a thing which is not that important, but I think people really appreciate that. And you need to be able to show that when you have not worked for a given period of time, people should know about that, and they should not assume that given you have not been communicating, you have been doing you know, secret stuff or all this kind of stuff. So I think that streamlining there all a bit, uh, showing that it is possible to have periodic updates every month or so, I think that's, I'm very proud of that. And if, what decision would you make differently if you were given another chance? Okay, so in a couple of occasions, I've been asked to try to solve conflicts, and in some occasions, I've been uh, uh, replying too, quick, too quickly to support one position or the other. So I don't have a specific example to mention, but it's something, there are a couple of occasions in which I've not been particularly happy about 
how quickly I reacted, giving the impression that I was in support of one position or another. And another one, which is something which I'm trying to work on, is uh, um, communicate more often, like blog more often, which some, seems like a silly thing, but in the world we live in, giving your opinion and show that you are present in a given discussion on some Debian-related issue or some free software-related issues is fairly important to, to play the role that Debian, I think, has to play. And um, how, how do you think it's possible to separate out the role as what, what you think and what the DPL thinks, okay. and, and again, what the project thinks? That's, that's pretty tough. So in the publicity buff, we have had, um, I recommend, not in the publicity buff, in the publicity talk, the press team made clear that every single developer, when it is asked an opinion, the, the people asking the question want that opinion to be the opinion of the Debian project. So if you have the head of the Debian, or the Debian developer and you say something, people want to take that as the opinion of the Debian project. As you can imagine, when they ask that to the Debian project leader, it's even worse. So I think that personally is one of the words I've used the most in when people were asking me questions. So I try to say, okay, this is my personal position, but it's, I mean, it's very difficult. People, if you, people want to make the headline, Debian thinks that they will make the headline. So... Yes, do, do you think it is possible to separate those roles? Not really, because uh, as someone pointed out in the past few days, you know, the DPL is the only elected body we have in Debian, so one way or another, the view of that person are representative of the view of the project. And no, so it's, I don't think it's really possible. And a, a, a final question. Um, what are you wearing under your kilt? <laughs> There is one, only one thing you can wear under your kilt, and you know that. <laughs> so I should have a... Thanks. Thanks. We, should, we should have about uh, 10, 15 minutes left for, for questions from the floor, which I, we do, so I did time it correctly. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, there's a couple there. One there first. There is. Uh, does it work? Yeah. Okay. So there's a question from ISC uh, related to uh, your... The kilt? No. <laughs> no, not related to the kilt. Uh, previous uh, project leaders had uh, seconds in command, and uh, as far as I remember, you don't. Uh, why? And do you think that having a second in command uh, could make it easier to uh, run for DPL for another year? Okay, no, I don't think so. Um, so there is a need of, you know, uh, splitting the task and not doing everything by yourself because if you do everything by yourself, the, the chances of burning out are very high. But when I, have, when I have had that need, I've tried to establish something more persistent for the future than just having a second in charge which will, you know, last only for this term. So what, I'm trying to, what I've been trying to do is, okay, there is a need to work on specific tasks. Okay, let's try to establish some position that will last in the Debian project and, uh, so that other people in the future can benefit from, it, from that without having to rethink about it every single year. The, the, on the other end, the problem of doing that is that, as I mentioned yesterday, delegation try, tend to be more sticky than they should be. So... This is part of the governance problem I was mentioning. So I, really, I would really like Debian to have some sort of governance body which are open and can be reviewed periodically and can be, have some you know, um, turnover within themselves. But, in, but even if there is this problem, I prefer to have some stable structure to be created than to have just you know, an assistant that will last only one term and then to need to be recreated the, the, the next year. I think there was a, another question. Steve, in the front. Oh, I think you were, f whatever. So maybe putting you on the spot. Other, can Ouch. you name any other people in Debian who you would like to see stand for DPL? I can, but I will not do that here. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Nobody has any other questions. This is your chance. The DPL is on the spot here. Andrew. Do you think that eventually the DPL will um, 
receive a stipend for their work or something to enable them to work more on DBN while they're the DPL and, and not need to hold down a job or, or be paid by an employer while they're the DPL? I have heard it quite badly. Can you yeah, um, do you think that um, the DPL should receive um, a, a dividend or an allowance or something that would enable them to work more full time on Debian rather than also have to concentrate on a, a job? Yeah, um, no, I don't think so. I think it would not be healthy in terms of you know uh, taking step. Taking a step in and say, I want to do that on a purely volunteer basis uh, and all this kind of stuff. So I don't think that would be healthy. In that case, um, does that limit the ability of people who might be suitable to be DPL um, in, to, to people whose employers are uh, happy for them to take the task on? And consequently, does that mean that Possibly those employers are, in fact, sponsoring Debian by supporting the DPL in that way for a year or two. Yes, it surely does limit the the, the, the set of possible candidates, and that's actually the reason why, in several countries around the world, elected bodies have you know higher salary than the average or this kind of stuff. And the argument they use is that that enables uh, even less wealthy people to to do that. At the same time, it's so for me, having Debian as a volunteer project is something that matches my view of society. So a, a society in which you have a job, but you also uh, take a step forward and try to help with, in your spare time, the society to run properly and to run smoothly together. So for me, it's really a challenge to, uh, to have Debian succeed, even if we are not uh, paid for doing what we do, and we have no guarantee to succeed. That's for sure. But for me, it's something that I, it's a battle that I want to see Debian fight. While the microphone's going back, um, how we, we have the Debian project who makes Debian, GNU, Linux, and hopefully K through BSD soon as well. Um, how much do you think Debian should try and take a political role in influencing um, not only societies, but, but well, also with it within the sort of free software world, how much we should be advocating for that. And how much also do you think Debian should be pushing for other ideals, for example, freedom of speech and uh, freedom of association and, and, and other human rights? Okay. That's an interesting question. I think that um, we, sh we have a role. So the Debian project is an association of people that have a mission of creating a free operating system, the best possible operating system. And I think that everything that touches that specific role is something in which we should be entitled to uh, make position statements or the like. An example is if software, software patents are some, something that arm creating a free software operating system, and they do, it's something on which we should have a position. And we could you know, send out statement on why this kind of stuff uh, hinder the creation of a free operating system. I don't think we should move past the border of uh, creating an operating system like uh, human rights or uh, um, green energy or whatever. And we sometimes have the tendency of doing that, but we should keep in mind that we have a specific mission and not try to stretch it to other stuff. Paul. So um, I've met one person at DevConf a few years ago who specifically did not want to join Debian because we have a project leader. Um, do you think Debian needs a project leader? Um, and any other comment on that? I don't know who that person is, but he has my sympathies. Uh, I would prefer uh, see Debian not having a project leader. I would prefer Debian to have a sort of board like many other free software projects uh, have and having that board having roles for election in the board and having that board express a sort of director or a representative of Debian or something like that. Um, that's not that much different on having a leader, but it will be, in my opinion, more open and more, uh, even less scary for the representative of the project. God. Um, you are running for a second year. Sledge was um, doing it for two years too. There were some discussions going on over the times that the voting overhead with nomination period platform and all this is quite a 
issue and there were discussion going on with extending the the term so what's your opinion of potentially extending it so one year is definitely too short for uh, various things the first thing is uh, learning the job which is something we can improve by you know writing down some documentation some best practices or the like and something that I've been planning to do since a long time, even though I haven't yet managed to actually do that. Uh, another thing which requires time is actually getting to know the people you will relate to, like a representative of other big free software projects or a representative of other entities with which you have to deal with, like SPI or any other trust organization. So all this stuff requires time. And in my experience, a good slice of the first year can be spent in doing that and in getting up to speed in working efficiently with those people. Two years is a better time frame. I think it would be ideal. But at the same time, if you are saying that the role is already a bit scary as it is, you know, extending the period to two years will make it even more scary. So I have sympathies with an idea of having a two years period with an easy way out in the middle. Like uh, by default, we have an action unless a given number of people says, oh, you know what, we are fine like this, and you just continue by default. Something like this. So we might find some middle ground, and I don't think I will push that myself because I don't think the priority of it is very high. But if someone else wants to propose a constitution change in that direction, talk to me, I will be happy to help. And there's a question just behind as well. So if, the, if one of the big obstacles for getting other people to apply to be DPL uh, is the NEM, well, one of the big obstacles in terms of doing the job is learning the job. Is it possible to have a three-month training period that's open to pe volunteers inside Debian to work with you and have you assign them tasks so they understand the process so even outside of the election? I've actually been trying to do that. I've been called for a volunteer to work on DPL-related tasks. And my idea was to actually do two things at once. One is the training, of the, but not training. I, it's not like I am entitled to train them, but showing what is about being a DPL. And also have the interested people forming a sort of informal board which meets every month or something like that on IRC and discuss what we need to do so that at the same time, it will give training and also more openness in what is going on. But in fact, I got only two people who applied and get a list of the things which uh, I have on my to-do list, and which can be outsourced, and then in the end, nothing has happened. So I'm trying. If someone is willing to apply and help out and discover what it's about, there is plenty of work to be done, and I'll be happy to work with anyone who wants to do that. I think we got... Uh Probably time for one more question, if anyone has them. No? Okay, well, it just remains to say uh, thank you very much to, uh, to uh, Stefano here, and um, hopefully we'll hear a lot more from you in the, in the future. Thanks thank a you. lot.